Let me now introduce our first segment, which is a conversation between two eminent persons, who you of course all know, in the field of European and global finance. May I ask please Supervisory Board Chair Andrea Enria and Jacques Delarosière on stage. Jacques Delarosière, former IMF Managing Director, Governor of the Banque de France and President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Please come to the stage and take your seats. Very low seats. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon, Jacques. Thanks for being with uh, with us today. Uh, that's a real treat for me. Your presence. Uh, you know, when uh, during these years, uh, when when looking at the challenges I was facing, uh, I was always always trying to find some uh, inspiration. And I always had basically three uh, masters in my Olymp personal Olympus I was looking at. And, uh, and they were, and they still are, uh, Alexandre Lanfalusi, Tommaso Palaschiop, and Jacques de la Rosière. I mean, they have been always uh, the persons I've been looked at to, you know, to their writings when I needed inspiration in front of different uh, difficult choices. And, uh, and Jacques has been, of course, when, uh, when the EBA was established, uh, a, 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 we started the dialogue and the friendship that I, is one of the, of, the, of the things that guided me throughout this, uh, this period. So thank you very much, Jacques, for being here with us today. That's really a, 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 a big gift for me. So, and I'm sure it will be the, the highlight of our event uh, in these days. So let, let me start. Uh, with a question, you with your group were at the forefront no, of shaping the response of the European Union uh, to the great financial crisis and to the sovereign debt crisis afterwards in terms of uh, regulatory and supervisory framework. Um, do you think that you, the reforms introduced uh, in Europe at that time are enough or do you think that uh, the turmoil that we have experienced with the, the shift, the rapid shift in, uh, in the interest rate environment recently require additional adjustments and uh, maybe to rethink part of the, of the work that we have done. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Andrea. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you this evening. I'm all the more delighted that um, you have chosen me to preside over this first conversation. And um, I want to say on the record that um, I have an enormous amount of uh, esteem and admiration for you for three or four reasons. The first one is that you are extremely competent and hardworking in your field. The second one is that you have a vision you don't just look at the immediate uh, hurdles. You have a vision. The third thing is that you have a will, a European will, which is something rather scarce at this time. And um, for those three reasons, you have enormously impressed me. And the fact that you have asked me to chat with you today is a sign of this mutual friendship. So to answer your question, is it enough what you have done on the regulatory side in order to protect the banks against the shocks? I think it is true that uh, the recent interest rate uh, hikes, hikes are having a serious impact on the profitability of commercial banks. Even if the Basel regulations address 
most of the risks. We must not conceal the fact that headwinds are threatening. They are threatening because the application of these prudential rules is far from universal. The IRRBB, the Quantitative Framework to Support Continuous Supervisory Assessment of Interest Rate Risk in the Banking Book, covers the current and prospective risks to earnings and capital coming from adverse movements in interest rates, affecting assets which are not marked to market. But this fundamental part of regulation is not universally applied. This is what you alluded to, Madame Lagarde, a moment ago. The result is that bank holding a large proportion of their long-term positions at low interest rates are particularly vulnerable unless they have internal models for managing and hedging those risks. Unlike Europe, the United States did not adequately incorporate the risk of rising interest rates into its supervisory mechanism. Inexplicably, at least for me, one of the only elements not included in US stress tests were the rise in interest rates. And I haven't yet understood how it could happen. Moreover, in the US, banks with total assets up to $700 billion are still allowed not to deduct from capital unrealized losses of such portfolios. This freedom in the United States is questionable. The recent Basel endgame proposal reduces this flexibility to banks below $100 billion total assets. It's not yet in force, but it's, it's the idea. And uh, that would leave many regional and community banks unprepared for potential liquidity stress. All in all, the IMF has calculated under its, quote, global stress test, unquote, a significant deterioration of common equity ratios over the last months. When enterprises start being affected by higher interest rates for longer, inevitably the quality of credit will deteriorate and non-performing loans will tend to rise. According to the IMF baseline scenario, 215 banks holding 42% of assets would prove weak. Given the importance of a weak tail banks, especially mid-sized banks, and a possible contagion to stronger banks, it would seem appropriate to take into account the possible capital losses of such banks in an IMF-type stagflationary scenario. This would lead to a somewhat more demanding regulatory framework and to a more extensive use of market fair value. These vulnerabilities depend very much on the business models of individual banks and on the stickiness or instability of their depositors. Supervisors cannot, of course, detect at all moments the combination of such numerous factors, but they should, in my view, see to it that they stay alert and are prepared to address at all times the remaining weaknesses of the banking system. So that's how I would, ask, would answer your first question, my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques. And, and indeed, I must say that um, 
I don't know whether I managed to pass this uh, consideration uh, enough to my team here, but uh, one of the learnings of the last period is that, uh, uh, you know, the use of market valuations in supervision, I mean, usually we don't do that. No? We, we, tend to, we tend to look at balance sheet indicators, but when things get rough, generally, uh, markets start looking at banks on a on a on a on a mark to market basis, and uh, and this can create very very rapid, uh, you know, uh, vicious circles. No, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, valuations going down, equity prices going down, and then these triggering uh, outflows of deposits. We have seen this very much during the spring turmoil. And, uh, and I think that we as supervisors need to think how to incorporate better also market valuations, market perspectives uh, in, in our day-to-day -day supervision. So that's a very good point that I take also from your, from your answer. Um, another point on which we have discussed a lot in the past, and you, you helped me thinking and shaping my thinking on that, but uh, the reality has not moved accordingly. Uh, is the point of integration in our in our market. Uh, we, 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 have, we have seen a lot of progress in the banking union, in realizing the banking union, but we have not seen a lot of progress in uh, uh, moving towards a generally integrated uh, banking market. Markets are still very much segmented along national lines, and uh, uh, no major progress, I must say, has been done uh, during the last, uh, the last years. Uh, what are, in your view, the causes and the implications of this fragmentation? Well, first of all, before I answer your question, I would like to say that uh, I was very happy and proud that you took over the first uh, chairmanship of EBA, which is a, a child of the... The, the group that I had the honor to chair uh, put, put forward. This group did not have the majority needed to move in the direction of a single supervisory mechanism, which eventually was uh, decided a few years after. And uh, I would like here to pay tribute to this unification and to the, to the SSM. Now, to answer your question about banking fragmentation in Europe and the fact that uh, the home host conflicts have not been resolved, uh, I would like to remind ourselves that uh, the initial objective of, uh, of a banking union was to eliminate the sovereign bank loop. Uh, banks were too much involved in financing governments, and uh, that uh, led them to supplementary weakness. And uh, because they, the weakness of the state that had to borrow so much was percolating into the banks that were financing those states. So the idea was to reduce this uh, sort of structural weakness. And um, if I look at the situation, uh, I don't think we have achieved this uh, objective. And we haven't achieved it not because of the banks, but because of the fiscal slippage, uh, which has happened in a number of countries because the budgetary deficits are forcing banks to contribute to finance these deficits. So this sovereign doom loop could even increase in the coming months uh, with quantitative tightening. Secondly, the bad memories, quote unquote, of the 2007-2008 crisis, particularly in countries like Belgium and Luxembourg, are still vivid. Authorities in host countries are requesting that uh, subsidiaries of large bank groups in 
the local economies have sufficient capital and liquidity in place locally to cope with crises affecting these groups. So this basically is a problem of confidence. And in my view, the essential cause of the compartmentalization that you are denouncing rightly. Now, I am not sure that branching is a realistic solution to this fragmentation problem, especially for retail banks, as neither the member states nor the banks themselves seem to be eager to, to do it. And uh, if that is the case, if large groups are not that interested in, uh, in getting complete fluidity capital-wise in, in, in their locations and implementations locally, then the question is, are we right to insist so much on our side to, to get this done? It's a question. Now, in my opinion, the creation of a European Deposit Insurance Scheme, the EDIS, would help to solve the problem. But uh, I'm not sure that it would be enough. And uh, what I see is that large banks are not very eager to have an agreement on the EDIS because it costs them a lot of money in terms of contributions. And they are entitled to ask themselves, is it worth putting so much money in uh, a universal uh, system of guaranteeing deposits when we know, it's the bank, who's, the bank who say that, when we know that uh, our financial credibility is bigger than that of small banks, and in a way we have to pay, i.e. reduce our profitability for the sake of banks that, in spite of your presence, are perhaps not as uh, securely uh, supervised as they they ought to be. So uh, I, I'm sorry not to respond in perhaps the 100% positive way that you might have expected <laughs> from me, but uh, I don't think you can make a banking union against part of the banks, a large part of the banks. and. When I say the large part of banks, I don't only think of the large groups. I also think of uh, mutual banks. Uh, I think of the German situation, which are, these banks are wishing to maintain their international, international protection schemes, the famous IPS. So should we go against those, uh, those views and those interests. Uh, I'm, I'm asking the question. Only the determination of the, of the largest countries in the Union based itself on uh, better economic convergence and therefore a return of confidence, only that determination of large countries, coupled with the will of uh, uh, most banks in these countries, would su succeed in resolving the current impasse on the issue of banking union. I'm sorry to have been a bit, a bit nuanced, a bit negative on some, on some accounts, but uh, I think the banking union is more the reflection of our European inability to 
advance on large projects in a mutually politically acceptable environment, then a purely technical question, which is, uh, we, shouldn't we go through branches and things like that? I think it's more profound, and um, I would, of course, hope that uh, this sort of move in favor of this movement uh, by large countries would appear. But for the time being, it is not there. And therefore, uh, I have to... I, I have to nuance my answer. Mm. I have to refrain from uh, taking up some of the points, but I cannot totally. <laughs> so, um, I mean, first of all, let's say I, I see your points, uh, uh, and they reflect a lot of the reality that we are confronted with right now. Uh, uh, but I tend to believe, first of all, if I look at what, uh, for instance, the um, the U.S. banks or the uh, or the Swiss banks that have uh, uh, recently you know, uh, uh, moved their business to the uh, to the euro area after Brexit, no, uh, most of these banks have adopted exactly a branching structure. So they have uh, integrated all their subsidiaries into the parent company, and they are now branching out throughout uh, the single market. So the paradox is that uh, the uh, the non-European groups are exploiting the single market to the, to the most, and the European banks are not. What is the difference? You, you touched an important point. The difference is deposits, let's be honest. When I talk to the bankers, they tell me, you know, if you go in a country, you are, do deposit taking, it's more difficult to do that without having a sort of, you know, uh, you, you are touching more delicate issues, and if they perceive that the local authorities are not uh, supporting this, uh, this branchification, they, they would not be uh, pushing that argument. But I also think that, uh, you know, uh, there is something at, the, at this juncture which is dependent on the, on the market environment. With, uh, with the current uh, uh, valuation, depressed valuations of our banks, of course, uh, banks have been all focused in pumping up their, their profitability, uh, increasing the remuneration to shareholders. They have not really invested in developing their franchise. I hope, I still have the hope, and don't kill this hope, please, that uh, uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, uh, when, you know, there will be a more, you know, uh, stable profitability, uh, and banks will start asking themselves how to invest in their future, how to develop their franchise. I mean, having a larger domestic market of 500 million uh, savers, I mean, could be something more attractive than developing, you know, little shops in different, uh, in different member states. I think there could be value for their own uh, business in doing exactly that. But again, I mean, I agree with you. And by the way, on the issue of the uh, cooperatives, savings banks, and especially the, the German Sparkassen, I've never understood why you can, I mean, I've never seen any proposal coming from our colleagues in Brussels uh, that has uh, proposed a dismantlement of the institutional protection schemes of cooperative and savings banks. I mean, we are always very supportive of these schemes. They can very well survive in a, in a complete banking union. But I know, I mean, but the point that you raise are relevant. I mean, these are the political sensitivities that still uh, put sense in the wheel of, uh, of the process. Um, yeah, may I just say that what you have just stated a few minutes ago is absolutely perfect. I mean, intellectually and uh, action-oriented, it's, it's perfect. I agree fully. But the reality today is that it's very difficult to launch this thing without more support from the big players. I understand that. I understand that. that. So, um, okay. Uh, now moving on. Um, one of the important points that were actually in your report, in the report of your group, no, um, back uh, uh, in when was it, 2010, if I remember well, um, was the creation of an integrated microprudential supervision and of a European macroprudential. Uh, supervision, macroprudential policy. 
Um, do you think that we have the right framework right now for addressing systemic risk at the, in, the, in the banking union, the, in the European markets, and uh, for smooth interaction between the microprudential and the macroprudential dimensions? Yes, this is a point that, um, that touches my heart because when we issued the report in the early months of 2009 on the improvement of uh, the regulatory and the supervisory system for banks in Europe, we touched on macro uh, prudential uh, risks and w ways to, to cope with them. It was one of the legacies of uh, L'Enfant Lucie, who had developed, I think, amongst the first, the importance of macro prudential actions. And we, we made a proposal in this report which was to create uh, a body called the ESRB, uh, which was a, a body within the ECB that was supposed to alert uh, countries, authorities, uh, public on uh, the macroeconomic risks that were looming. And I must say that uh, this construction that we proposed and which was adopted eventually by the Council and the Commission and the Parliament have, uh, have not lived up to our expectations. Uh, I have stressed this many times uh, in front of the Commission which uh, asked me to elaborate a bit further on this uh, uh, ESRB system. In my opinion, with hindsight now, I, I think the, the Macro Prudential Council would have been more effective if it had been separate from the ECB. I'm sorry to say that in this August uh, uh, building, but uh, I think if it had been separated from the ECB and if it had had a broader composition with uh, practitioners, uh, theoretical people, but also technicians, academics, uh, it would have shown perhaps more uh, accuracy in its uh, in its uh, feelings and uh, more independence. Because, to say the truth, the big crises that have happened since the uh, creation of that body have uh, neither been predicted nor even felt or sensed by that uh, council. And I think that that uh, inefficiency, to say the least, uh, should be sanctioned by a change in, in the body. Now, I'm sorry for the bluntness of my remarks, but it's only a repetition of what I have already said over the last years. Finally, you have not asked me that question, but I'm, I'm going to raise it. Um, <laughs> The, de the development of uh, what we call non-banks in recent years should continue uh, to concern us. Uh, the role in financing the European economy has doubled since 2008. Doubled. So it's not uh, a sympathetic little problem that we have on our minds and we just think of something else just afterwards. It's something that is fundamental. It's, uh, it's, it's half the financing of uh, what the banks finance in, in Europe, which is enormous, because the markets are much less 
potent in Europe than they are in the United States. So if you, if you look at it statistically, the non-bank uh, intrusion in our economy is much higher than it is in a country like the United States. And still, nothing happens much, a bit. There are regulations, but not it's not regulated like the banking system. And uh, I think that uh, the repercussions of possible defaults uh, would affect, of course, the banks, which are the main creditors of those non-banking institutions. And therefore, if it was only for the contagious uh, problem, I would be anxious. But it's much more than the contagious problem, because uh, their deficiencies or failures could, could have uh, very serious repercussions on the, the non-banking sectors also. So I think it's a problem, uh, since we have the privilege of talking freely today, I think it's something that your successors and Madame Lagarde should look at because it's, uh, it's uh, I have been uh, accustomed since 2007, 2008 to say, A, it's very important, B, we're going to work on it, and C, nothing happens. So, I'll say it again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I think our time is, uh, is, uh, is over. I don't think that, uh, that we can, uh, that we can uh, uh, say, anybody can say that we uh, invite you here to flatter us with, uh, <laughs> with compliments, uh, of course, but I think that your, your critical, your critical uh, remarks and your also knowledge of uh, the real obstacles that we are confronted with and the challenges we are confronted with is something that uh, keeps us on our toes and uh, reminds us of the difficult challenges we have. Also, on this issue of non-bank financial institutions is something that, uh, you know, the ECB has been raising for a long while. It's, it's a big challenge. And, uh, of course, we, uh, the, in the banking supervision side, have tried to, you know, do our best to make sure that what is the interface between the banks and bank financial institutions uh, is well uh, safeguarded, well overseen. Uh, but that indeed is a, is a challenge, and you're right in uh, reminding us that, uh, you know, uh, uh, alerts have been raised uh, since a long while, and unfortunately the willingness to move forward with uh, greater ambition in terms of deploying regulation and supervision in this sector has not uh, succeeded. Anyway, thank you very much, Jacques, for your time with us, for your wisdom and for your continued sharpness and contribution to our debate. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure all our uh, audience here did as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.